Sabujinkan is a style of martial art that is often associated with ninjutsu. It was founded in 1970 by Masaaki Hatsumi, and it is a collective of nine ancestor schools. I recently received an invitation to take part in an opening of a brand new Bujinkan Dojo that was setting up in West Palm Beach. Now, having no previous experience or contact with the art, and in addition to receiving many requests from viewers to cover Bujinkan and other ninjutsu arts, I figured it was worth checking out. I first want to thank Daishi Han Chris Carbonaro for reaching out to me and inviting me to spend a day training with them. He teaches Bujinkan Ninjutsu in New Jersey and his student, Sensei Philip Angel Smith, was opening up his own dojo here in West Palm Beach. To celebrate, they were getting together a small group of students to break in the new dojo and have like a little seminar. Now, the whole purpose of this YouTube channel is to explore, learn, and then share the martial arts with everyone. We've talked about this before, but many arts are plagued with politics, and Bujikan is no exception. In my research, I found a very large stigma against the art, and there have been unfortunately many who have taken advantage of the commercialization of it and only hurt the integrity of the name. But I also found that there were a lot of pockets of dojos that stood out as being reputable and passionate about what they do, and offered a valuable school of thought. So when I first arrived at Sensei Angel's school, I immediately recognized that this dojo was part of the latter group and that they took their art very seriously. They hold a very deep respect for those who trained before them, and they work very hard to preserve the traditions of the art. They welcomed me into their home, and they gave me a taste of their craft. Uh, my name is Christopher Carbonaro. I've been studying in the martial arts for about 25 years. Uh, I started when I was 12 years old with uh, Taekwondo, did some Wing Chun Kung Fu at one point, as well as Aikido. Uh, when I joined the military, uh, I was stationed in England. During that time, I studied at Parker's Kenpo Karate for a few years, and then I got stationed to Japan. I went to Yokota Air Base, Japan, and at that time, I started studying the Bujinkan Budo Taijutsu martial arts under Masaki Yatsumi in the Hombu Dojo in Noda City, Japan. Uh, my name is Philip Angel Smith. been studying martial arts since I was three. Studied all styles, uh, Taekwondo, Karate, Kung Fu, uh, mainly uh, Jeet Kune Do, Muay Thai, and uh, boxing. And uh, a little bit of Kali Arnaz Eskrima, but that was when I was younger. I started training with a gentleman by the name of Paul Fisher when I was a teenager. And then after a couple years, he uh, introduced me to a gentleman by the name of Dick Severance. He's a very well-to-do Bujinkan instructor and a Navy SEAL. I trained with him uh, until he uh, passed. And then when I moved to New York, I uh, eventually found uh, Chris Sensei and I've been training with him for the last uh, five years. To explain what the art of ninjutsu is is actually a very difficult question. Everyone thinks ninjutsu is Hollywood ninja, and it is not, right? It is a very deep study. The techniques themselves come from various different schools that we study, which there's basically nine different schools of martial arts that we study, and we try to uh, reach that goal, or obtain that goal with everything that we practice. The whole idea of Bujin Khan, Bu is warrior, Jin is uh, Kami or uh, God and Khan is Hall. So really Bujin Khan is a place where the martial gods study. The whole idea of the Bujin uh, comes from paying respects to Takamatsu Sensei. It's this idea of how Atsumi Sensei looks at Takamatsu Sensei and that's what the, the name Bujin uh, is actually attributed to. Every school uh, basically has its own uh, makeup of different techniques such as throwing techniques, uh, striking techniques, weapons, you know, some schools concentrate more on one weapon than another, but more or less they all have everything, right? Um, so you have all these techniques that we practice are found in each of the nine schools, including the weapons, but it's done slightly differently. There's uh, what's called tokcho, or a characteristic uh, from each school, which makes it slightly different. So Hatsumi Sensei, uh, you know, learned the, the nine schools that we practice from his teacher, uh, Takamatsu Sensei. He basically studied with him for roughly 15 years, traveling back and forth, uh, you know, from his home to Takamatsu Sensei's home. And during that time was able to, you know, learn 
the, the nine schools that we currently study today, along with the weapons and, and, and everything encompassed in that. Hatsumi Sensei basically took what was originally called Togakure Rinpo Taijutsu and at one point called it uh, Bujinkan Budo Taijutsu. I actually asked him this question personally one time and I said, why did you combine everything together? And what he, his answer at that time was, uh, because if you take every, all the schools and you put them together, you have uh, more tools to pull from out of, you know, uh, like your toolbox. Instead of just having one specific movement from one school, right, you're able to then learn all these different schools and you have different techniques that you can utilize at one point in time. I have a lot of experience with private security and um, with the other styles. It was very engaging and aggressive and with Bujinkan I found that you had options. You could interact with people in a different way and it was tactical so you could you studied what you were engaging yourself into not just one way to handle a situation it gave me options to, to disengage engage uh, and survive really having takamatsu sensei teach hatsumi sensei directly and there are a number of, of individuals who are still alive that were training with hatsumi sensei at the time that he was training with takamatsu sensei um, is a very very uh, close moment in time to learn these techniques. Uh, mainly if you train with someone who studies in sword, their teachers, 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 teacher may have used a sword in battle. Uh, Takamatsu Sensei had lived in China for uh, roughly 10 years or so and during that time he utilized most of the skills and most of the arts that he had practiced up until then. So you're getting a very direct transmission which is uh, quite interesting uh, from that point of view. And then Hatsumi Sensei obviously who's 87 years old now um, still actively teaching, uh, you know, making uh, DVDs, movies, videos, and he's teaching that then directly to us. That close transmission, I think, is very special, but unfortunately, it's very difficult for people to grasp, right? Ninjutsu is something that's very difficult and takes a lot of dedication. It's not possible for everyone to grasp it. Now, Bujinkan is not an art that you take casually, or at least not if you want to become good at it. It is a commitment, and even the simplest of basics can take years to master. Hatsumi Sensei is a true master. I was very fortunate that when I studied these other martial arts, I did study with people who are higher level uh, martial artists. As you study these other schools, you tend to see that at the higher level, you know, these people tend to have a certain level or a certain aura about them, if you want to say. And uh, with Hatsumi Sensei, it's the same. He is basically inspiration, right? You go and you, you, you go to see Hatsumi Sensei so that you can be in his presence, listen to what he says, watch and what he demonstrates. Um, so that you know you could be inspired. This is what I you know take away from it a long time ago And I was very mistaken, you know trying to mimic the techniques that he was doing when I went to Japan um, You know I later learned that it's, it's, it's not possible right and because you have a guy who you know at this point has over 60 years of martial arts experience How can it be possible to mimic something that he does without having that background? It's not possible, right? You have to study deeply so um, you know, I was on a certain path and then I ended up starting a new path and starting from the ground up because, you know, I realized that uh, there's a lot more to this and, uh, you know, I have no problem, you know, starting from the beginning. Chris Sensei is obviously very strict on, on the basics, Kihon, and but within the basics, uh, everything is accessible. So w with my students, I try and teach a, a broad understanding of, of survivability. How do you uh, engage your environment? So. Uh, you know all your options to engage, not engage, etc. I've been studying Bujinkan and Jitsu for about uh, 13, 14 years now. The Bujinkan is very unique. I personally like it because there's so much history and background in it, and it's a martial art that you can't learn overnight. It takes deep study and self practice in, in order for you to get good. So, someone cannot read a book and just learn it, or just go to a class and learn it. You have to really dive deep into it uh, within yourself and you have to really want it. This is the official opening of uh, my dojo. So uh, Chris Sensei was kind enough to come down from New Jersey. Usually we all go up to him several times a year and he was kind enough to uh, come down and do the opening for us and teach. So I didn't look to open up a dojo. Uh, you train, you train diligently and your Sensei kind of advances you. He, he'll come up to you or she'll come up to you and say, okay, you're ready for this. After a while, he said, okay, it's time for you to start being a teacher. 
like officially. And then after a while, he said, okay, it's time for you to open a dojo. So I, I never really sought it. The uh, dojo kind of found me. This dojo here specifically is called the Bujinkan Okami Dojo. And uh, Okami, uh, not meaning big god, but meaning uh, wolf. Um, this is one of my students, uh, Philip Smith's dojo. And this is what we're calling a dojo buraki. So this is the first official event here at his dojo. Usually in the beginning of every year, we do a dojo buraki. We open up the new year. And, and uh, usually I hold that event at my dojo in New Jersey. Uh, every January, the guys come from you know, all the different locations and, and we hold this event. But the significance of, of today, that, that's what this is for. We bowed in the class and we went over the basics as an introduction to the art. We ran through several drills that included warm-ups, rolls, light grappling, and even basic weapons drills. Now, a lot of these concepts were very, very different from my experience, but I knew the second that they put their hands on me that a lot of these techniques were very effective. I was particularly impressed with how tight and controlling the joint locks were, and resisting against them was actually pretty painful. Additionally, they are very good at concealing strikes, and there were several instances when they were demonstrating techniques that they would suddenly insert two or three strikes that I never saw coming. So I had a blast on this day and it was a very positive experience learning something new and different. We start off with uh, what's called bowing in, bowing out. Um, basically we get ourselves centered and uh, we pay respects you know, to those who have died before us. Obviously these techniques were, you know, came from the battlefield. People died for these techniques, so we have to have that respect. Then we um, start with stretching exercises, then breathing exercises, then we do, uh, you know, rolling, leaping, break fall exercises, then we practice uh, stances, kicks, punches, kicks, the basic ideas of movements. Then usually we choose what the theme is for the class. And then we usually end the last part of class with some type of weapons training. The one thing that's interesting is you have sports martial arts, which is very good. I mean, it's very useful. It's uh, very effective, right? We can't, uh, no, no one should discredit any martial art, right? There is credit or merit do right to all martial arts if you do not pay attention to the fact that people in the street do carry weapons whether it's a chair a knife a broken bottle or something like this the way that you move will determine whether or not you can get out of the way safely and you can counter attack if, you, if it's necessary so uh, the movement is foreign and it actually takes a deep study or dedication to try to learn the movement. But the thing is, is that if you study with a sports mentality and you're fighting someone that has a weapon, it could be very dangerous. It's not about my technique is better than your technique type thing. It's this awareness that you build um, while studying. And of course, the same. If you come across someone who does Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or boxing or something like that and you don't respect them, there's nothing to say they're not going to lay you out or choke you out. And it's very important to have respect for all martial arts. It's just the goal is a little bit different. We also try to build the body and, and move our body in such a way that we are able to preserve our body for old age. For me, it's very fascinating to see Hatsumi since 87 years old, still very flexible, can sit up, uh, can sit on the floor and stand up very easily without any problems. The way you practice now is an investment for your future. One of the biggest things is a lot of martial arts today have become this type of dance. I think a lot of the time that happens because they don't have an instructor that necessarily knows how to maybe teach correctly, wasn't, didn't receive the information correctly. In order to receive correct teachings, you must have a relationship with a teacher. And it doesn't mean any teacher. It means a teacher who actually knows what they're doing. Especially in America, most martial arts are all about making money now. Right, so it's all about fitness, it's all about jumping around, and maybe those teachers do know the real way, but they have prostituted the art. Or maybe what they do is they have a generic class, but then on the side they do have personal students. You need to seek out a teacher who actually knows, and then you need to build a relationship with them. I never, I never give up on being a student. I think a lot of teachers nowadays are teachers. That's it. I know everything and I can teach it. For me, it's not like that. I'm constantly trying to learn. I think the difference is, is, is our school is dedicated to the preservation of the art. We study very diligently and it's not for everyone. And uh, my school is not commercial, but if people want to learn, I will accept them, of course, you know. But they have to put in the time and the dedication for that. Now it's important to keep in mind how far back some of these methods go. Bujikan has some deep roots and some of the ancestor schools go back several hundred years.
Now there were times where I was struggling with the concept or didn't quite understand certain body stances or hand placement until it was demonstrated within the context of a weapon and then everything made sense. Some of these techniques date back to the time of sword fighting on the battlefield, and it was really fascinating to have the opportunity to catch a glimpse of some of this history. Even after 26 years of martial arts experience, this felt like day one to me. I think the weapons training is an equalizer, and if you don't practice properly in the basics, when you move into the weapon, it's non-functional. Um, traditionally, Japanese martial arts would, would start off with long-range weapons. Um, and you would work your way down to intermediate range and then close range, and then you usually would end with uh, mutodori. So when you practice with these long range weapons specifically, it really helps to reinforce your kamai, or your, your stance, uh, your distance, your timing. And then while working through the different ranges of um, weapons, you learn different distances, you learn different timings, um, you learn the difference between a weapon without a blade, a weapon with a blade, a weapon with a three foot blade versus you know a two inch blade or something like this, a projectile. So it, just, it gives you experience because you have deeply studied all these different weapons, all these different ranges, and now it's the point where you're able to move freely without a weapon because you understand those distances. So it's, it's all study, there's no magic. If you talk about shuriken, projectile weapons, maybe on the surface is for distraction, right? I throw something at your face, you then get distracted by it so I can stab you with something. There are also things like putting poison on the end of a shuriken. There's all types of way to hold it, there's all types of way to stand with it, there's all different methods of throwing, all different directions, angles, holding other weapons while throwing it, the, using it in the middle of a technique, how to deploy it, there's many, many, many things to each one. It's not so simple. Uh, in the Bujinkan, you have a black uniform. Usually, uh, we wear patches. Those are what sig signifies the ranks. It's called Wapen. And there's different colored patches as well with stars and, and as you go up the ranks. Usually, a white belt uh, is, you know, before you get any rank. And then as you go through ninth Q to first Q, you're wearing a green belt. And then as you get Shodan and up, you're in a black belt. Also, for females, sometimes you see them wear a red belt during the Q ranks. And sometimes they have a red gi or a purple gi. There's a company out there that we use, uh, it's called Yari no Hanzo, it's out of uh, Italy. He makes uh, really good quality weapons and, and uniforms. He uh, studies the same style, you know, the same lineage, I guess, that you know, we study, we follow. So he was able to modify things and make things that, that made more sense for what we practice for. So basically, um, what we have is we have the Kamidana area, and the Kamidana area is uh, the, f the, the center focus uh, of our practice. The Japanese people put a lot of emphasis on paying respects to the ancestors. So one of the things, and there's a lot of history for the Kamidana, but for us specifically, one of the things that's important is it's up there to remember those who died in battle before us. Um, so we use that as a focal point. Uh, so usually when you walk into a dojo, you bow, and most martial arts, you find this. But in America, you don't have kamidanas. So you lose that tradition and now it becomes something where, okay, I just bow to pay respects for the, for the space, right? That's what it turns into. But it really comes from having kamidanas and things like this. Uh, and there's other martial arts that have shrines, whether you're Chinese martial art or Korean martial art or Indian martial art. So this is where all these things are coming from. And th that's the main focus, that's the main point in the dojo. And it gives us a different respect when we're in the dojo. It, it, you know, this is not a place where we horse play or, you know, uh, you know, curse or mess around with, you know, with each other. The idea is to be respectful and always be mindful of those things. So that reminds us of that. So then the main thing for me, I am very big into the culture and the traditions. And you know, uh, there are some people that have way more knowledge than me, but they don't, they don't get into the cultural stuff or that that's not for them because they have their own ways of thinking or their own religion or their own culture. Or, but for me, when you uh, study with us, we preserve everything, you know, because that's how I was taught. I started in Japan, it doesn't make me any better. I'm just saying I started in Japan with the Bujinkan, so you know, I speak Japanese and uh, I was brought up um, with uh, you know, one of my first teacher, which is Kamiyoko-san, um, and I, I live with him and everything, and I, I was taught a certain way. So I can only do for my students the way that I was taught. And I think that's important to understand because sometimes people don't know why someone's doing something. And you have to understand that you can only do what you were taught to do. So if you don't have that experience, it's impossible for you to teach that. And you shouldn't try to teach something you don't know. Always be uh, humble to know that you, there's still more to learn. I am 
always in a disbelief that this stuff actually exists, that this stuff actually made it through a thousand years. And there are, of course, other schools that have done the same. I always am excited when it's time to practice. And I think that it's very important to have this type of feeling when you do martial arts. Once you lose that and it becomes too you know, rigid or it becomes too, it's not fun anymore or I think it's not good. So I think that uh, it's important to uh, maintain that if you're training martial arts today, you have to have a certain mindset. You have to have a, a certain dedication. And I think that through the practice that you've seen today and, and, and this interview, um, you know, I hope you guys get a sense of that. That it's not just kicking and punching or it's not just fluff mystical silliness, right? But there's an actual, there's actually something behind it. There's a foundation, you know, that there's something actually there. And this is what we're trying to do. But most people don't dedicate themselves. I mean, when I say most people, I say probably 99.9% .9 of people. It's a very few people who actually dedicate themselves for the practice itself. And they're not trying to get some personal gain or something because it, it turns to something else. And that's what happens in most martial arts, you know, not just the Bujinkan or whatever, right? It's, it's, it's the same all over, I think. It makes things very real. It allows you to look at things differently, and you have to, when there's a weapon pointed at you, uh, you have to really control your emotion, so it's, uh, it becomes very real when weapons are added. This is hard work, and it's a tradition. It's not just what you want to do, so you have to follow those before you uh, to be effective in it. You can't uh, pick and choose what you want to learn. You have to learn the right way, and there is definitely a right way to learn and a structure to learn through. And uh, if you follow that, uh, you'll go very far and be very successful in this art and, and successfully be a part of a tradition. Not what you want, but a, an actual tradition that's been alive for a very long time. I would like to extend a great big thank you to Dai Shihan, Christopher Carbonaro, and Sensei Philip Angel Smith for including me in this experience. It was a true privilege and only reinforces our goal. This is why we do this channel, to learn different ways, even if it's something that you aren't personally interested in as a lifestyle, but to observe, learn, understand, and, and appreciate others' ideas and share them with everyone else. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you've enjoyed this episode as we're trying to bring different flavors of arts into the mix. So please subscribe, click on that bell icon, and that way you'll be notified of the next art videos that we come out with. I would love to hear your feedback, so please share your comments below. Thank you.